Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this special edition CSP webinar. I am joined today by lead SE Chris Edwards and uh, another lead SE Nir Benjamin from our America's CSP SE team. And we have the rest of our CSP SE team on the line here to answer all your questions today around moving to Citrix workspace. So no question is too technical. Please use the question chat within your GoToWebinar panel for any questions you might have throughout, and we will have the team answer them as soon as they come in. So with that, I'll hand it over to Chris and Nir to take it from here. Awesome, thanks Rose. Um, so welcome everyone, and thank you for joining the uh, CSP Masterclass uh, Journey to the Workspace. My name is Chris Edwards, and I am a sales engineer with the CSP program. And my name is Nir Benjamin, and I'm also a sales engineer with the CSP program. So, and today we're going to walk through the full Citrix workspace stack and show how it can add value to your customers and value to your business. And we have some demos of the multi-tenant Citrix virtual app and desktop service, content collaboration, analytics, access control, and we will end with a demo of micro apps. So stay tuned until the end. And we have some polls throughout the presentation to keep it interactive. And um, we have two hours packed full of content. So as Rose mentioned, we have a team of sales engineers to answer the questions that you submit in the chat. And if your native language is in Spanish or if you feel more comfortable asking questions in Spanish, feel free to do so. And we have sales engineers that can answer you in Spanish as well, right? And then on the at the end of the <clears throat> webinar, we will come on and address some questions live. So let's jump right into it. So we know that many of you didn't start off as service providers. Most of you evolved into hosting your customers' apps, desktops, and data. And I've talked with service providers that started out as things like BreakFix IT consultants, or you know, started with a VoIP offering, or even one CSP that started with modem sales. And then, you know, over the years, things like virtualization came into place that made it, you know, possible and more efficient to host customers centrally. And you know, there's all these benefits around standardization and economies of scale that made the service provider model uh, more possible. So the point is that a lot of CSPs evolved into having a desktop as a service offering or a software as a service offering. Now, I remember when I started in IT uh, about in about 2004, um, it was mostly PCs under the desk and, you know, strictly Windows applications, a server closet down the street or, or, or down the hall or a colo down the street. But things are very different now, right? Things have changed. We have all these new types of devices and, you know, we're all seeing the prevalence of SaaS apps and public clouds. And there's all these new security threats that your customers face and they're turning uh, to you to solve, right? So. Um, you know, the, the world is changing and this creates new challenges for our customers, but new business opportunities for our service providers. So let's kind of walk through the history of service providers, you know, at least in the, the DAS space. So in the past, you would host some customers Windows servers, their Exchange server, their SharePoint servers, maybe even back in the day, some BlackBerry Enterprise servers, and then you'd install your customers Windows-based apps, so a lot of these client-server applications like their CRM, their ERP, their line of business apps, then you'd host their files and customize the environment to that customer and then provide the secure remote access over Citrix, right? So back then, you were a great consolidator of all of your customers' technology needs and you were able to offer kind of this enterprise IT setup that the customer otherwise would not have been able to afford themselves, right? And because the customers are only paying for a slice of that total infrastructure, the servers, the networking, the data center costs, right, et cetera. And in most cases, you're delivering this as a per user per month uh, offering to your customers, right? But the point is that back then, everything was consolidated and hosted within the physical limits of your infrastructure. So then browser-based apps arose. So these are uh, you know, legacy or traditional client server applications where you are still hosting the back end of these enterprise apps, but now the users are accessing the front end application through a, a web browser. And that really set the stage for what was coming next, where now we've all witnessed SaaS really taking off 
And a lot of those CRM, ERP, and line of business apps that you used to host for your customers are now in the cloud, right? So everyone on this webinar probably has customers with SaaS apps, or you have customers that are looking to move some apps to the cloud. And then we saw traditional Windows-based apps moving to the cloud with Office 365, you know, or really we could consider that a hybrid cloud app where there's a SaaS version, while at the same time there's a traditional uh, installed version that's more full featured. Um, but now, so for a lot of service providers, it doesn't make sense to continue hosting things like Exchange and, and SharePoint, um, where in many cases your customers are already paying for that hosting from Microsoft. So, and while all of this was happening, of course, all these new devices came into the workplace with smartphones and tablets and, and Chromebooks and customers wanting to bring their own devices or your customers looking at the cost savings of BYOD. And now, of course, public cloud is on everyone's mind. There's all these new cloud options of, you know, where to build your customers' environments or, or run their workloads. So, where in the past you were a great consolidator, now you need to be a great aggregator that allows your customers to have the choice of where to run their apps, their data, their workloads. So with these changing times, there are you know, new options for your customers, new expectations, new market demands. But with these changing times comes new opportunities for our CSPs to continue to evolve their offering. So if we look at Citrix and what it means to service providers, what it means to your business in the future direction of where Citrix is going and what that means to the future of your business, Citrix is helping you transition from a great consolidator to a great aggregator. And as your customers migrate to public cloud and to SaaS apps, we help you uh, continue to deliver the premium work experience to your customers where the users are the center of their workspace, no matter where their apps, desktops and data reside. So, and the good news is that the demand for offerings like yours is growing. According to MarketWatch, the DAS market is expected to reach 10.8 billion by 2025. And in that same article, they referred to something as uh, workspace as a service as kind of a subset or a value add of DAS, right? So, um, you know, the, 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 the market and customer base is really shifting to expect to consume cloud services and pay on a month-to-month -month basis. And a new opportunity that we see with these changing times is that traditionally, a lot of our CSPs played in the SMB space. Because if you brought on an enterprise customer, um, that would be very difficult for you to scale that rapidly. But with public cloud and the simpl simplicity of Citrix Cloud to run those workloads in public cloud or on your customer's premises, we think that you have a new opportunity to go after the mid-market and enterprise space. And, you know, we're, we're seeing this a lot with service providers, you know, ones that I talk to every day that are now being presented with opportunities in the tens of thousands of users, right? So it makes sense that customers of all sizes want to pay for this type of DAS or workspace as a service offering on a monthly basis um, because we're seeing that shift that Microsoft and other cloud and SaaS providers are, are driving. So in the past where these customers were used to buying these things up front, like servers and enterprise software, right? But now it's all available as a monthly service. So um, the consumer, especially the enterprise consumer is a more educated buyer in the terms of pricing options that are out there. And they want an as a service option um, on the table that is more flexible and allows them to scale up and scale down as they grow or to rapidly accommodate uh, seasonality in their business, right? Or new demand that we're seeing from COVID-19. And if we look at the financial benefit of Citrix and the CSP program, um, we're helping you build a subscription business with recurring revenue. And we all know that Wall Street and investors love recurring revenue. I've talked to a lot of service providers that are looking at CSP to shift from professional services to more managed services by building a uh, bundled subscription offering of compute licensing and services that has much greater stickiness and revenue predictability than professional services. So with Citrix Workspace, we're enabling you to increase your addressable market by going after maybe SaaS only customers 
or customers that want the workloads in public cloud or on their premises. So we're helping you extend your market reach while increasing your average revenue per user by adding new services and value uh, to your customers. So with your bundled offering, by going to market with Citrix Workspace, this enables you to sell more of whatever other services that your firm offers to those customers, right? So whether that's custom software development, managed services of their on-prem endpoints or networking or UCAS, the point is that going to market with Citrix Workspace positions you to sell whatever other services your firm offers to those new customers. So <clears throat> over the next uh, about two hours, we're gonna walk through the full Workspace stack show you some demos and talk about how each component adds value to your customers and new opportunities for your business. So we're gonna go through Citrix virtual apps and desktops, access control, content collaboration, endpoint management, analytics, and we will end with micro apps. And of course, Citrix workspace is powered by cloud services, Citrix cloud services. So think of Citrix cloud as a control plane that spans multiple cloud services. And these cloud services are readily available to consume. In most cases, all you need to do is uh, subscribe and activate them. And the benefit to you is that the core infrastructure that you would typically have to install, manage, maintain, and upgrade yourself is now managed for you um, as a service. So, and with Citrix Workspace being cloud services from Citrix Cloud, we're reducing your operational overhead and making it easier for you as a service provider to get environments up and running quicker, um, onboard new customers quicker, and go to market faster. So with that, we'll jump into um, the uh, Citrix Virtual Apps and uh, Service from Citrix Cloud. But actually, before we do that, Rose, can you kick off the first poll? Sure. So if you can navigate to this uh, screen and actually click on yes or no for the question, are you using Citrix virtual apps and desktop service from Citrix Cloud today? We'll give you all a few seconds to answer. All right, let's see what we have here. So it looks like the majority of our attendees, Chris, are not using Citrix virtual apps and desktop service today. Yep, so that's a good mix, but it looks like about 30% are, right? So some opportunity for the other uh, 62%. Um, all right, so is the audience view showing my screen again? Yes. Perfect, thanks, so we'll jump right back into it. So um, what we see from a lot of service providers who started out small and grew their business over the years and grew their environment over the years is that now they have many, many different versions of uh, Citrix virtual app and desktop environments, right? With even some legacy, you know, 5.x, some Zen app 5.x and 6.x, and they end up with environment sprawl and version sprawl so there's all these virtual machines and Citrix implementations that you have to manage, maintain, upgrade, troubleshoot, right? So there's a huge amount of operational overhead um, as well as the cost of the physical hardware associated with those virtual machi machines. And maintaining all of this really affects uh, your ability to expand and onboard new customers quickly. So, if we look at what a traditional Citrix deployment looks like, right? And I'm sure you guys have seen this slide before. Basically, all of the components are your responsibility to install, maintain, troubleshoot, and upgrade. So on the top, you have things like the delivery controllers, the SQL database, uh, your license server, and then you have your Citrix gateway and your server and desktop VDAs, or what you can think of as your application servers and, and virtual desktops. And if you watch while I change the slide, now you can see that all of those top components, the infrastructure components, are now made available to you as a cloud service. So your delivery controllers, SQL database, storefront servers, gateway appliance, and license server 
are now installed, maintained, and upgraded by Citrix in an evergreen fashion where you always have the latest and greatest service, right? So you still bring your own Active Directory domain and you choose where to run your VDAs. And the cloud connector is how you tie in the resource location to your Citrix cloud account, which gives your CVAD service access to spin up the VDAs on your hypervisor or cloud and gives you access to publish apps and desktops um, to your users and groups in your Active Directory, right? So basically we turned the traditional Zen app and Zen desktop deployment into a consumable cloud service that makes it even easier to deploy VDAs to various resource locations, various data center locations, various public cloud locations, and incredibly easy to tie in multiple active directories, right, by just simply deploying cloud connectors. So we've made this even easier for CSPs with the recent multi-tenant functionality that we added to the CVAD service exclusively for CSPs. And when I say multi-tenancy, I don't mean multi-tenant Active Directory. What I mean is the ability to run multiple customers within the same instance of the Citrix Virtual App and Desktop service, right? Where in the past, you could only run one customer per CVAD service. So the top portion here represents the multi-tenant CVAD service running on the CSP's Citrix Cloud account. And in this first scenario, which would be for um, smaller customers, we have two customers that are part of the same Active Directory domain that you are managing from your multi-tenant CVAD service. And each of these two customers gets their own Citrix workspace. You know, what you could think of as a cloud-hosted storefront they get their own gateway service, so they get their own workspace URL, right? A customizable cloud.com URL. Um, you know, they can brand and customize their own workspace, and you have the ability to configure authentication methods on a per customer basis. But from the Citrix Studio perspective, you are managing both customers, machine catalogs, hosting connections, delivery groups, published applications, all from that same studio console. So same management console, but they get their own workspace. On to the next scenario for customer three. This is the same as customer one and two. They get their own workspace. You're managing them within the same studio as customer one and two. But this customer, you've decided to put them in their own Active Directory domain. And I see a lot more CSPs uh, going this route. And then for the last scenario with customer four, this represents a larger customer where you decided to spin up their own single tenant instance of the CVAD service. So this is where you will be isolating and managing their delivery groups and machine catalogs in their own instance of Studio, right? And the point of the reference architecture is that you can mix and match all three of these scenarios, whatever works best for you uh, and your customer scenario. So one thing that I've touched on a bit that I want to um, double click on is the benefit that you get with the CVAD service and the seamless multi-location management of EDAs. So in the past with the traditional CVAD deployment, it, it was possible to deploy VDAs to multiple locations with things like zones and satellite sites, but it was much more complicated it you know, takes more architecture and planning and overall effort to implement and maintain that complex of a deployment. And in the past, a lot of CSPs as part of their service only ran the VDAs in their cloud or data center. But now with all these public cloud options and, and more educated buyers, or maybe you're going after the mid-market and enterprise space that wants DAS but still has a data center uh, footprint and IT staff, Citrix Cloud makes it very easy to put VDAs in your data center or expand to a new data center on the other side of the country or in your customer's data center or in Azure, AWS, GCP, wherever, right? So if you think about taking on a customer that's so big or so large that you can't expand your environment quick enough, public cloud now makes it possible to take on these large customers because you have that you know, seemingly endless scalability and with Citrix Cloud, we make it easy to tap into that and accommodate really any, any use case. So this expands your reach as a service provider to go after new opportunities and of course, uh, more revenue. 
So as I mentioned before, the DAS market is growing and there's all these customers out there looking for an offering like yours. And Citrix Cloud enables you to lower your operational overhead, right? Especially for CSPs that are building out a Citrix environment on a per customer basis and putting customers each in their own domain that have grown over the years and now have hundreds of environments that they're managing, maintaining, and installing. And, you know, they have all these different versions and inconsistencies across customers. And then onboarding a new customer means some heavy lifting, and, and it's a time-consuming process to get that customer up and running, where with Citrix Cloud, we're alleviating all of that operational overhead with, you know, way less setup to get a customer onboarded to where we even have an example of a CSP that was signed up as a CSP and had the customer environment set up in Citrix Cloud all within the same day, right? So alleviating this operational overhead allows your you to shift your staff to spend time on more value-driven activities for your customers, like optimizing their image, optimizing their user experience, you know, spending more time just tailoring that environment to that customer, or shifting your staff into roles like service delivery managers or VCIOs or even pre-sales that can help uh, drive more deals to close and onboard more customers. And of course, the ability to seamlessly scale your environment with Citrix Cloud and, and tap into public cloud resources allows you to accommodate seasonality in your customers' businesses or you know, the new demand that we're all seeing with COVID-19. So Citrix Cloud allows you to deliver a business continu continuity solution to your customers where you can rapidly respond to that uh, newly created demand um, or you know, even allows you to scale if you were to unexpectedly take on a very large customer. As we're seeing more service providers turn to public cloud, one feature I wanna to touch on is auto scale. And this is a feature of the CVAD service that is built for reducing public cloud costs. So how it works is, first of all, it changes the way we do session load balancing. So in the past, we would spread user sessions out across all VDAs in the catalog, where now we stack the users. So it will stack the users on the first server and then turn on the next server as the first one nears capacity, depending on your buffer, then stack users on the second server, then turn on the third server, et cetera, et cetera. And then as user sessions start to drain, it will disable logins on the server with the least amount of connections and um, as all the sessions drain, it will uh, power that VM off, right? So it's an automated process. And, you know, the, the point is to power on the VMs when you need them and power them off when you don't need them. And our tech marketing has a tech brief on Autoscale where they did a lot of testing uh, with various scenarios and used, you know, login VSI to simulate the user logins. And they found that we can save over 70% on Azure Compute compared to having those VMs run 24 seven. So we saw as low as 198 hours per month as opposed to 730 hours. So this is really making sure that evenings, late nights and early mornings, as well as you know, weekends and holidays, that for all these scenarios, you're using the least amount of public cloud resources to greatly reduce your customers' uh, cloud compute bills. Another great cost savings feature is uh, the resource optimization of workspace environment management. And the uh, WEM resource optimization component optimizes RAM, CPU, and I.O. and makes sure that you know, runaway processes don't take over the VM. So you can use less resources while providing a better user experience to your customers, right? Especially with server-based apps and desktops where multiple users are running on the same VM. And I did a blog post with a service provider um, that is using WEM in Azure, and they saw up to a 75% reduction in one customer's Azure bill. So this customer had an application that would just chew up endless amounts of CPU, and they were able to use WEM to address that and, to do, and reduce their, um, their Azure bill. So while this was an extreme case, the partner did note that they see about a 30 to 60% um, average uh, per customer in, in Azure cost savings. So if you combine WEM with Autoscale, you're using less expensive VMs with WEM, and those machines are only running when you need them with Autoscale, right? And that's huge cost savings 
for your customer. So with that, Rose, can you go ahead and kick off the next poll? Sure. So if you can answer on the screen again, we have a second question. Are you using Citrix Workspace, workspace Environment Management for resource optimization currently? Give you a few more seconds to answer. All right, let's see how we did. So it looks like about three quarters of our attendees are currently using it for resource optimization. Awesome, thanks Rose. Cool, so that so a good opportunity for those of you that um, are using WEM is that another big benefit of the CVAD service is that you actually also get the WEM service. So you don't have to install and manage the WEM deployment on your premises. All you need is the cloud connectors, which are probably already in place. And then you just install the WEM agent on the VDAs. And you know, from there, you can figure all of your WEM uh, policies from the Citrix Cloud Console. So for those of you that are new to Citrix Cloud and to the CVAD service, uh, what I want to bring up is that this is the same platform as the on-prem version. You still get HDX, you know, kind of our secret sauce, um, all of those things that you can only get with Citrix. So the leading multi-monitor support, the broadest peripheral support and printing support, the leading protocol with ICA to deliver the best uh, user experience over any network, um, leading GPU capabilities, the leading you know, voice, video, and multimedia redirection capabilities, and things like Teams and, and Skype optimization, right? All of these things that you can, that you can only get from Citrix that truly deliver that everyday workspace you also get with the CVAD service from Citrix Cloud. And on that same note, you have all of the same delivery options as with the on-prem platform. So you can deliver browser-based apps, and even with SaaS, this might sound counterintuitive, but there are SaaS apps out there that have prerequisites. They require a specific browser or Java or a Flash version, and the best way to deliver that is still with Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktops, then you have your Windows server-based published apps and desktops, and then you have you know, persistent and non-persistent with VDI, with Windows 10, and now even multi-session Windows 10, and also Linux apps and desktops for those of you with that use case. And then we've seen a lot more of this with COVID, remote PC, which lets you install the VDA on a physical desktop and allows the user to connect to their uh, physical desktop remotely over HDX. So for that one user license, you get the ability to publish all of these things and as many of them as needed uh, to that one user. So to wrap up the section on Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktop Service, this is really gonna help you go to market faster and onboard uh, users quicker. It'll help you scale rapidly to address uh, seasonality and burst and business continuity with things like COVID. And by easily tying in multiple resource locations, it will help you expand your market reach and your total addressable market to go after uh, new types of opportunities. So with that, we're gonna jump into our first demo of the multi-tenant Citrix virtual app and desktop service. So here, what I'm gonna showcase is kind of two isolated customers in two different resource groups uh, in Azure where I only need four virtual machines per customer, domain controller, two cloud connectors, and a VDA. And these other um, machines down here I'll use in the micro apps demo later. And then over to my second resource group, which again represents my second you know, isolated customer in an isolated networked environment, as well as an isolated Active Directory domain. Here I just have four virtual machines to make all that work. Then here's my CSP Citrix Cloud account where I have all my cloud services. And of course, uh, we have the concept of customers 
where you can go in and add new customers and, and spin up uh, services on these customers. So in here, I'm gonna showcase how I have two separate customers, uh, Yodabyte Inc. and Yodabyte 2 Inc., where I have already provisioned the multi-tenant uh, CVAD service. So now I'm gonna flip over um, to those customers just to show you their workspace configuration while we manage both those customers within the same studio. They get their own workspace. So we'll go into workspace configuration where here I have set their workspace URL. So we have yodabyte2.cloud.com um, for this customer. And then we can set an authentication method on a per customer basis. And then we can even go in and customize and brand uh, that customer's workspace experience uh, separate from our other customer. So now I will flip over to my other customer just to show you their workspace configuration very quickly. And uh, again, they have their own workspace and they have their own you know, customizable URL and we could brand uh, that workspace to that customer. So now I'll flip back to my CSP cloud account and jump in to show you the resource locations. So of course I've created a resource location per customer where I you know, each have those two cloud connectors that I showed you that are um, running in Azure. Um, and, and you definitely wanna make sure that you separate out your different customers in different domains into their own resource locations. And then the cloud connectors is what pulls in the Active Directory domains. So it's csp.local and csp2.local is what's running on those domain controllers in Azure. And in multi-tenancy, you point the cloud connectors to your CSP account and how you link the domains on your partner tenant to your customers is through that manage federated domains. And you could link a domain to multiple customers workspace. So here this is saying, you know, only users of CSP.local can log into the Yodabyte Inc. Um, workspace. So that's how we're isolating that. And then here on the um, CSP, 2.local, we're mapping that to the Yodabyte to uh, Inc. customer. So now I'm gonna flip over to the virtual app and desktop uh, service from Citrix Cloud to show you what the Cloud Studio looks like. So I'll go into full configuration. And here we have <clears throat> all of our different delivery groups for all of our different customers. You can see I have delivery groups down there for Yodabyte 1 and Yodabyte 2. Um, you know, where I've published out the desktops to those VDAs that I have running in Azure. I've also published out some applications to those customers and separated them into their own folders. Then another thing that multi-tenancy does is that it creates a scope on a per customer basis. And now when you create a machine catalog or a delivery group, the last screen in the wizard will actually ask you if you want to um, assign that studio asset to a specific scope, right? So that's how you can lock down, you know, which admins have access to which customers access within studio. So now I'm gonna jump over and log in to each of my customers workspaces. So there I have yodabyte2.cloud.com, which is tied to my CSP2 domain. And we can see I have my published desktop there. And then I'll log into my yodabyte1.cloud.com, which is tied to my um, csp.local domain. I'll go ahead and log in there as well, where I have my published apps and desktops. And then I'll go ahead and launch my uh, published desktops for both, most, both of these customers. And uh, we can see that coming up there. So you know, here's where I'm showcasing two isolated customers two isolated networked environments, two isolated Active Directory domains, two isolated um, workspaces, right? But I'm managing them all from the same studio. And the one thing that I wanna show here is that I actually have WEM running in this environment. So there you can see the agent over on the bottom right. And I've locked the taskbar and hid the recycle bin, right? Just a few policies that I set just to show that I, um, you know, that WEM is doing its thing. So now I'll flip over to show you what I have in uh, the WEM console. So again, this does work with multi-tenancy. So I'll go into manage my, my WEM environment. And what I've done is I've split out these two customers into two separate sites. 
right? So if I go into Yodabyte 2, um, here I've just set a, a few basic policies like locking the taskbar and hiding the recycle bin. And I'm isolating this site to Active Directory objects within the csp2.local domain. So just to that, um, the users group, and then to the VDAs in the csp2 domain. Um, so that's it for this demo. I just wanted to quickly show you how I was able to get multi-tenant uh, CVAD service up and running. Uh, and with that, Rose, we will kick off the third poll question. Sure. So if you could answer this question again, uh, we have, are you currently using or planning to move to a public cloud provider? And we have a few options. Azure, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, or Oracle Cloud. Or if you're not planning to move to a public cloud provider, you can select no. We'll give it a few more seconds here for you to answer. All right. Thank you for your responses. Let's see. So it looks like the majority of you are using or planning to move to Azure. However, we do have a significant part of our audience here that is looking at AWS or not moving to a public cloud at all. Awesome. Yep, that was a good, uh, good mix there. And with that, I will hand it over to Nir. Thank you, Chris. All right, guys, so now we're going to jump in and talk about how the Access Control Service can help you deliver secure SaaS apps to your customers. So the technology space is seeing explosive growth of SaaS apps, and um, there's a few stats on the slide that I'd like to share on that. So starting with the number of SaaS apps used by organizations are growing as more applications are being transformed into web apps, and the average spend on SaaS apps is growing year over year. Um, but the key stat here is that from a survey, we found that 73% of organizations have indicated that nearly all of their apps will be SaaS by 2020. Um, so if you think about your business, what does that mean to your model? And how do you stay relevant in a SaaS-based world? So these are some of the key points that the Access Control Service looks to solve. Now we're gonna look at some of the challenges customers face with SaaS apps. One of the main issues that the Access Control solves is SaaS app sprawl. Customers that use multiple SaaS apps have multiple URLs for access with different sets of login info at each one. Um, and this leads to a poor user experience. But besides that poor user experience, IT also has no control or security on the endpoint or the browser that the end users are using. Um, we also see that compliance is also a concern for customers in specific verticals. So being able to control the browser helps them stay within those compliance requirements. We're also going to talk about some of the main use cases of the Access Control Service, which are single sign-on and enhanced security controls for SaaS apps. Single sign-on provides a single pane of glass for end users to log in once and have access to all of their apps in one place. Having just one login and password to manage greatly improves the user experience and helps admins keep control over identity. Also, from an admin standpoint, you're able to layer policies on top to control the access the user has while accessing their SaaS app. So these are going to include things like watermarking, restricting copy, copy and paste, printing, um, and even restricting downloads. Um, Citrix already has built-in templates for many of the most commonly used SaaS apps on the market, and we're adding more every day. Um, you can also add any custom SaaS app of your choosing, um, but as you can see on the slide, we have templates for all the main ones like G Suite, Salesforce, ServiceNow, Workday, Concur. So it, we have quite a bit. Um, so the next slide is going to talk about the policies that we can apply to these SaaS apps. So you can see that some of the policies I was just mentioning, right? So like restricting printing, watermarking, copy and paste. Um, you'll have all of these all of these options on either custom or uh, the template-based SaaS apps. Um, and when you enable enhanced security, the SaaS app will open a secure browser session running in Citrix Cloud. So this is going to allow for the session to run remotely as any Citrix session would. So if the customer's endpoint was infected with the virus, it would not affect the session. Um, and there's also a few added policies, such as restricting key logging, 
or screen capturing, which is going to be included in an add-on pack called App Protection. Um, this is going to be available in the CSP program soon. So I want to talk about um, a bit about the end user experience of accessing a SaaS app through Workspace. So what you're seeing on the slide is going to be the workflows of what would happen as a user accesses their SaaS app. Um, the app is going to launch according to the deployment and policy settings you've chosen, right? So um, starting if we if starting with if we um, if you if you put enhanced security set to off, essentially you've just provided a single sign-on experience, and the SaaS app will open in a new tab in the user's browser. Um, but if you have enhanced security set to on, the SaaS app will open in a secure embedded browser within the existing user's browser. So this is essentially a Citrix session that is running remotely via Citrix Cloud and has all of the policies that you've, that you've set enabled. Um, one thing to note is that from within a SaaS app, a user might click on the links that direct them to secondary websites. So as shown in the slide, you'll be able to either allow, deny, or redirect this traffic based on website filtering and categorization. So as of today, we currently have um, 191 different website categories that you can use to filter their web traffic with. Um, so now we're going to talk a bit about the, uh, the customer needs for secure access to SaaS apps, right? So just to kind of give a recap on some of the topics I've discussed um, with the access control service, um, customers can achieve a single sign-on and consistent user experience when accessing their SaaS apps. They can achieve compliance within the verticals that they work in. They can enable a secure browsing experience and protect their users from common web threats. Um, and the user's website traffic gets fed into the analytics service so admins can get better visibility into the websites that their users are spending time on. Um, we'll actually discuss later in the webinar what this actually means and how the analytics service works. Um, and then with that, uh, on every section, we're going to end with what the opportunities, what's the opportunity for CSPs. So in this, uh, with Access Control, um, it gives you a way to stay relevant in a SaaS-based world while also adding new value and security to your customers' SaaS and web apps. Um, this is going to enable you to expand your addressable market in that you can go after new customers who might be all SaaS based, um, as well as traditional customers who might be implementing a more hybrid approach with both SaaS and um, legacy server based applications. Um, so before I jump into the demo, I believe we have a poll, yes. So. All right, so we have another poll on your screen. What percentage of your customers' apps are SaaS-based today? And this is just an estimate. Um, none, or you can choose up to 25%, between 25 and 50, 50 to 75, or 75 to 100%. We'll give you a few more seconds to answer. All right. Thank you for your responses. So it looks like the audience is using up to about 50% of uh, SaaS-based apps today. Thank you, Rose. And yeah, that, that honestly falls in line with what we're seeing, right? So I think so I said only 6% have no SaaS apps. So we expect uh, that to just continue growing into, uh, into the next few years, right? Um, and then, so with that, I'm going to show you guys a demo of what it looks like to actually launch a SaaS app um, and set one up. But I believe we still see the poll. So Rose, can we um, go back to the presentation mode? No, I think we're actually back on um, the, or the PowerPoint screen. Here, Nir, I'll, I'll kick off. I am here, Nir. I'll kick off your demo now. Okay, because I'm only seeing. There we go. Um, okay, so the main purpose of this is just to walk through what it looks like to publish a SaaS application, um, and we're also going to show you the extra layers of security that you can lay on top of the layer on top of the with the enhanced security policies, right? Um, so right now I'm going to log into Citrix Cloud um, and I'm going to choose on the customer that I have the demo set up on. Um, this is, of, of course, the admin view. Um, and once I get into the main screen here, I'm going to click on the access control service. And then I'm going to click on add a SaaS app. And then the next screen I'll be clicking on add a web and SaaS app. 
So the first thing you'll see is that the cloud platform already has many built-in templates to the most commonly used SaaS apps in the market today. And we're always adding more to this list. Um, but for the purpose of this demo, we're going to skip choosing a template and we're going to show you how you can set up a custom one. Um, so the next step is to put in the details of the app. Um, and for this, I'm going to choose outside of my corporate network and I'm going to call it um, Salesforce Secured. And I'm going to put in the URL to the SaaS app. And of course, this can, have, um, this can be any SaaS app of your choosing um, that we don't already have a template for. Um, you'll also notice that the related domain will automatically get populated for me. And then the next step is to go to the enhanced security page. So this is where we can apply settings to secure the session with things such as watermarking or restricting uh, clipboard access or printing. Um, later in this demo, we'll show you what the user experience is for a user with and without enhanced security turned on. Um, and the next is either to use or not use single sign-on, but for the purpose of this demo, I'm not gonna use SSO today. Um, and then at this point, we've successfully published the SaaS app, right? So it was just a few steps. Um, and now I'm gonna flip over into uh, the user experience. So we're gonna log in and I'm gonna, I'm gonna log in into my, into my workspace and I'm gonna show you both a um, one with and without enhanced security, right? So I'm gonna go to my apps and I want you to notice that I have um, both a Salesforce and a Salesforce secured SaaS app. The one that has secured in the name is the one that, um, that we've applied the enhanced security policies to that we just showed. Um, so I'm going to launch the Salesforce, Salesforce without the enhanced security. And essentially, you'll see that it's logging, it's logging me into Salesforce in a tab in my local browser. And once I'm in, there's no extra policies added. So this is going to allow me to do things like, um, like copy and paste, right? So you'll see that here on the screen. And that's essentially it, right? I'm in here and I can get my work done. So uh, I'm also going to show you what it looks like to launch the Salesforce secured um, with the enhanced security policies that we set. Um, so in this case, you're going to see that a Citrix session is actually being launched, which is a bit different than just opening it up the way we did before. Um, you'll have all the extra layers of security on there. Um, and this is actually launching a secure browser session in a tab within your local browser. So you can tell that it's a Citrix session because um, you, you'll see it has a watermark displayed. And um, I will actually won't be able to do things like copy and paste. Um, so let me try that right here, right? Um, you're going to see that I will try to copy and paste right here. And you're going to have to trust me that I am right clicking, but the screen is not popping up to, to actually copy. Um, but besides that, everything is the same. Uh, you, you, you do have the option of doing both enhanced security or not. Um, that would be up to you depending on your specific needs with the SaaS app. Um, and, and that's essentially it for the demo, right? So I'm going to flip back to the presentation and um, I think, yep, and Chris is going to be talking about content collaboration now. All right. Thanks, Nir. Yeah, let's jump uh, jump right into content collaboration. Um, so as the saying goes, content is king, right? The foundation of every workspace is content, <clears throat> whether it's a customer with apps and desktops or a SaaS-only customer, right? They still have documents and files. They still need to collaborate with their colleagues, and they still need to share files externally, right? And they need all these things securely. So as a service provider, by centralizing your customer's data and giving them an enterprise content solution, you're building the foundation to sell them more services. So a lot of customers are, are, are companies are using legacy file servers and maybe even FTP servers, and they have various cloud storage vendors, sometimes even different vendors for different departments. And with this data sprawl across you know, different locations and, and platforms, Users don't have all of their content available to them anywhere across any device to be able to access and collaborate on this data with the same enterprise functionality and security capabilities across all of the data, wherever it is, right? And we even hear of employees using their own personal cloud storage vendors, which should raise huge red flags for everyone on this webinar. So we have a data sprawl problem, a user experience problem, and a security problem. So if we look at content collaboration and some of the high level capabilities, the first and most obvious is that content collaboration makes it incredibly easy to access your files from anywhere and on any device. And we have clients that work across Windows and Mac 
where the users get the same uh, experience as well as on mobile devices with iOS and Android. And we even have a web version for accessing on a kiosk or you know a friend's computer. And we even integrate with the Office 365 viewer. So if you don't have the application installed on the endpoint, you can still uh, view the files. So second, we make it incredibly easy to collaborate with your colleagues. So there's a lot of personal cloud storage solutions out there, which are personal cloud storage solutions, not enterprise file sharing solutions. So that anywhere, any device access that your customers use for their personal files, they also have access to their shared folders and network shares so they can easily collaborate with their colleagues. Third, makes it easy, uh, incredibly easy to send and receive files with external vendors and partners and customers. And you can even create collaboration spaces with shared folders where the external users can view, add, modify, and delete uh, whatever permissions you choose to give them. And by the way, there is no charge for these external users, which we call client users. Um, you know, things like emailing large files, it's simple, just send them a share file link. Um, and to do that, we also have an Outlook plugin and Gmail plugin, you know, that gives them the seamless ability to share files externally. Another great feature is self-service versioning. So content collaboration creates a new version every time a file is saved. So if a colleague overwrites some changes or a user needs to roll back to a previous version, they can easily do that without having to call into your help desk. And we also have some other capabilities like the ability to uh, customize file retention policies or enable archiving for your customers uh, with compliance needs. Another cool feature is feedback and approval workflows where you can pick a document specify whether you need feedback or approval and pick your approvers and the deadline and they will get an email requesting their feedback or approval um, and you can see the annotation coming in real time and you know you can collaborate and and reply in real time so i use this uh, a lot in my previous role when i was in market marketing to be able to gather feedback from a large number of people on a document um, and another cool thing is that the workflow will continue to remind people to submit their feedback as the uh, deadline is approaching. Another great use case is that we have the ability to get legally binding e-signatures for your customers that have that need. Um, it's very easy to use. Just pick on the document where the signature is needed, add the recipients, kick off the workflow, track the progress, and I'll be showing this in the demo coming up. And think of content collaboration as an aggregator of all your data sources. So of course, content collaboration has its own cloud storage, but you can also use your file servers for storage zones. We have connectors to integrate in network drives, as well as connectors for all of the major personal cloud storage vendors out there. So a lot of customers have different users and different departments that have different cloud storages, and end up with this data sprawl. So we can solve that data sprawl problem, integrate it all in for the user, and you know that data, wherever it is, make it accessible to your users from anywhere on any device, while adding on top of it all of the enterprise uh, file sharing functionality and layering on top all of our advanced um, security functionality. So speaking of security, right, the whole point of content collaboration is that we are doing all of this uh, securely. And we have some pretty neat secure sharing capabilities. You can expire links. So if you sent out a link that you want to retract, you can do that with a click of a button. When sending out a link, you can choose to limit the number of downloads or limit how long the link is active. You can even choose to share the document as view only or view only with the watermark, right? So the, the person you're sending it to won't be able to download the file, but they can only view it in a web browser. And you know, you have um, all these options when you're you're generating a link, or as I mentioned, you can create a collaboration space with your external users, your, your clients, by adding them to a folder, which will require them to create a username and password, and you can control the permissions that you give to those external users. 
So, and that's just, you know, kind of the short list. There's a lot of other things that we're doing around security. We are encrypting your data at risk. At rest, you can implement multi-factor authentication. You can remote wipe the data container from a user's endpoint. Uh, you can even integrate with a preferred DLP and you know restrict access to certain network locations. Um, but there's a lot more that we can do when we integrate with Citrix endpoint management. So there's a huge list here, but you know things like blocking screen capture, blocking copy and paste. Right? There's a, a hu huge list of additional capabilities when we integrate in with Citrix endpoint management. So <clears throat> to wrap up, you know, content is the uh, foundation of a workspace and protecting your customers' intellectual property um, while giving them the ability to collaborate across their organization and externally from anywhere in the world is foundational for building a uh, core offering that you can add new services to that's going to increase your average revenue per user and develop the stickiness that is going to keep your customers coming back for more services. So with that, we will jump into the demo of content collaboration. So the first thing I'm going to show is how to provision content collaboration to your customers from Citrix Cloud, right? So go to your Citrix Cloud account and click on customers. And then I'm going to go back to that Yodabyte 2 customer that we used in the previous demo. Just click on those three dots, click on Add Service, and click Continue next to Content Collaboration. And that's going to bring us to the form for you know, the workflow um, to provision content collaboration to this customer. This top piece is informational, so I usually just pick Content Collaboration by itself. Then you enter in what you want for your um, customer's URL for their subdomain and click check availability just to make sure it's available. Um, I recommend always starting with a trial, right? But you could go right to a paid service if you want to. And then pick the version. Advanced is kind of the most common version and the premium version is gonna give you some of those more premium features like the uh, e-signatures and custom workflows. And then fill in your master admin details and you, you kind of want to use like a shared admin email address here, right? In case that person leaves the company. And then you want to put in your help desk information that your customers um, will use to contact you for that level one uh, share file uh, support. So after you have all that in there and click next, this is going to bring you to the storage options. I just recommend going with Citrix Cloud Hosted because it's easier but you can choose to run your storage zone on-prem. And we even have multi-tenant storage zones where with that one set of storage zone controllers, you can connect that to multiple customers' content collaboration uh, accounts, right? But for simplicity, I recommend going with Citrix Cloud uh, hosted storage. So I'm not gonna kick that off here because this is just a uh, demo account, but now I'm gonna flip over and show you the content collaboration um, experience integrated in with Workspace. So here I have all my apps, my favorite apps. Um, I actually have over 170 applications published to my user account. <clears throat> and I have all that alongside my desktops. So I have multiple Windows 10 desktops, as well as a um, server-based, uh, Windows server-based published desktop. And now I have all of that alongside my files and my content, my data. So I have my personal folders and, you know, this is where I keep all of my documents that I work on on a daily basis and collaborate with my colleagues on and my partners on. And then we have shared folders. So these are folders that have been shared with me uh, internally, right? So my team has a team shared folder where we all work together and collaborate on documents. And then I even have integrated in here my, um, my OneDrive uh, cloud storage from Office 365. So I'm going to show you kind of some of the, the most common capabilities and functionality, um, starting with just generating a link, one of the, the things that I do most often. So just right click the file, get a link, and then we have some different link options like emailing me when files are accessed, whether they can access it anonymously or if they have to provide a name and email address, whether it's view only online or full control whether I want to expire the download link after a certain amount of days, 
limit the number of downloads and choose whether they always get the latest version of the file or if they get the version at this time while I'm generating the link. So I would typically just copy that and throw it into an email or Slack to send to a partner or a colleague. And then versioning here is another um, cool uh, feature. So every time you save a document, it creates a version of the file or anytime a colleague uh, saves a change, it'll create a new version. It makes it really easy to go in and just self-service uh, roll back to a previous version. In my inbox, I have everything that's been sent to me. And in my sent box, where what I want to show you is where I can just go in and very easily uh, pick on a link that I've previously sent out and just go in and expire that link. So then over in people, if I were to click on to, uh, browse clients, this is where I could see all of those external users within my organization. Um, or I could come over here and I could create my own external user, right? So if I'm, I'm working with a partner and I wanna add them to a folder, I would just fill out their information. And then here I could just come in and snag the folder and give them the permissions that I want. <clears throat> and the cool thing is that if they don't have a share file account, it will require them to create a username and password. So I'm gonna show you another way that we can add people to a folder. So if I go back to my folder over here and click people, people on this folder, you can see I've shared this with my buddy uh, Nir. And then I can just click add people to folder. And here I'd be able to search for all of my internal company users as well as my external users. Go ahead and pick which folder permissions I wanna give them. And I could even come in and create a new uh, client user here as well. So now I'm gonna show you our uh, e-signature uh, capabilities. So if I right click here, I have a lot of different options on that file like checkout, initiate approval, send for signature. So I'm not gonna click that there, but I wanna click on the document to show you the Office 365 viewer. So here we have a contract that's saying that we agree to pay me $1 million. And then here's some of those right click context options on the right. And I'm just gonna click uh, send for signature to start you know, kicking off this workflow and preparing this document. I need to get my $1 million as soon as possible. Um, so I'll click prepare document and just put in a name there. So we'll go with Bill Gates and then just use my uh, personal Gmail account. Now here's where we can drag and drop the fields that we're requesting them to fill out or we could drag over um, some annotation so we can annotate the document. So I'm just gonna drag over a signature field and a date field. And then I'm just gonna drag over a text field so I can annotate the document with signature just so they know, um, you know where to sign the document. So next for review, before we send it out, we could also turn on a passcode right, to make sure that that's going to the right person or we could expire the link. So now we've kicked that off. It's in the, the pending state. And I'm gonna pull over my personal uh, Gmail to where we have um, the email from Content Collaboration to go ahead and sign this document. So this is, you know, the experience of the recipient. So this is, you know, just as we annotated it, I'll go ahead and scribble on my signature and pick a date and go ahead and submit that. And now um, this has been executed, right? So here we see it's uh, shown as executed on the top right. And I, I will back out and back into this folder just to kind of refresh it. And now we see the uh, signed icon on the contract doc. So we can click on that to view it. And there we see the Email came into my, my corporate account that the contract has been executed. Here we could download or share this signed contract. And then it also drops a contract signed certificate PDF um, in, your, uh, in, in that folder as well, right? So this was um, integration with content collaboration in Citrix Workspace, but now I wanna show you Citrix Files, which integrates in uh, your content collaboration files and folders with Windows Explorer, right? And you can very easily um, integrate with the native applications. Um, so here we just open this uh, contract in Word 
we'll go ahead and increase that to a uh, billion dollars. And I also have a lot of the same uh, share file functionality, right? Things like copying a link that I could send out. Right from here, I could do things like initiate a workflow. Uh, I could also come over and um, check out a document, right? So my colleagues know that, that I'm working on this document. I could also, if I'm going on an airplane, I could make this available offline, right? Because these are just pointers to the files. And then I could also manage some of this folders uh, properties such as the permissions, right? Which we also saw in um, the integration with Citrix Workspace. Now flipping over to my desktop, what I'm showing you here is that across multiple devices, I have my same workspace. So I have all my same files that I can work on between my endpoint and my virtual desktop you know, as well as my wife's iPad, whatever. Um, so here again, we're also integrating in Citrix files into my virtual desktop. And then I'm gonna show you the uh, Outlook plugin. So we can attach files from our, our PC or from um, content collaboration. Here's some of the options that we can set by default. So view only online, view with watermark, require and sign in, uh, et cetera, right? Those are the, the default options for every time I, I create a link. So here I'll just go in, share the document, go into my personal folders, and we'll go in and we'll pick that uh, signed contract. And you know that just drops it right there in my email. So when I send that over, um, and it's not actually putting the file in here, it's putting a link to the file that uh, the recipient can download. We can also request files. So here's some of the options uh, for requesting files. And when I click that button, it just drops the link right into my email. So uh, my recipient can click that link and can go in and uh, share files with me as well. So that's all we have for this demo. Of course, there's a lot more to share file, like uh, things like workflows and custom forms. So definitely get with your uh, sales engineer for a deeper dive into content collaboration. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Nir. Thank you, Chris. So now we're gonna discuss the value that the endpoint management service brings to securing mobile devices. Um, basically, everyone's having their employees bring their own devices at this point, and that's great because honestly, BYOD initiatives save customers a lot of money. Um, mobile devices today are really productive devices, and they've changed the game for how people work, how they access their email, corporate data, applications. Um, and with all of these new capabilities, security, new security challenges are created for companies. Um, so today, almost everyone has a mobile device. Um, so end users are accessing their corporate data, apps, and their email on an unsecured device, and they're walking around the world connecting to all sorts of hotspots and airport Wi-Fi. Um, wrapping security around this without intruding on the comfort of BYOD is what the endpoint management service looks to solve. And next, we're going to have a poll on that. All right, so the poll has been launched. The question is, what percentage of your customers are embracing your, the bring your own device today? I'll give you a few more seconds to answer this. All right. We'll wrap it up here. So as we can see, it looks like the uh, the audience is a little mixed here. So we have um, varying percentages of bring your own device for our CSP customers. Thank you, Rose. And so just to give some insight in what we're seeing in this space, right? I know we saw that just 12%, 12% of you guys said you're not seeing any BYOD. Um, but we found that seven in 10 data breaches originate on user devices. We found that vulnerabilities were found in about 38% of mobile applications for iOS and 43% for Android. Um, and 70 million smartphones are lost each year. So if you think about it, it's a huge security risk with all of that corporate data that gets lost and not having the ability to wipe those devices. So the real question is, how do we keep your customers productive while keeping their mobile data, application, and intellectual property secure. So the endpoint management service allows us to containerize corporate data on a device. The isolation of this data will allow us to protect against data leakage 
and will also assist with maintaining compliances such as HIPAA or FINRA. Um, you'll be able to add policies like preventing copy and paste, restricting printing, downloads, um, and even taking screenshots, right? So these policies will only affect the specific applications you containerize, and it'll help isolate the corporate data um, and applications from the user's personal stuff on the device. Um, so just to give an example, right, a, a user would not be able to copy corporate data on his device out to a personal application. And of course, um, within their personal apps, they won't be restricted and won't feel like they're being controlled. Um, also, with mobile device management, admins will have device level control um, that'll give them the ability to do things like remote wiping um, or checking if the device has been jailbroken. So it's all of these things that we're doing around security that enables your customers to have a BYOD initiative and be confident about its security. Um, the endpoint management service comes with a suite of productivity apps that are available on iOS and Android. These productivity apps will allow users to keep personal space separate from the workspace. Um, and Citrix delivers a great user experience um, for, for mobile users with such enterprise grade mobile applications. Um, in addition, the applications are integrated in a manner to not only improve productivity, but protect the user data at the same time. So we're going to have encryption and isolation on the device, but what about the data in transit? Um, the endpoint management service will leverage a per app micro VPN that will allow only those applications to leverage the VPN communication back to the data center. Um, this is going to ensure that the data in transit is traveling across a secure path and protected from being exploited. Um, in this space, one of the most common questions we get when discussing endpoint management is, is my device supported? So Citrix's solution supports major platforms such as iOS, Android, Windows and Mac, um, Chromebook, and even IoT devices um, such as like the Workspace Hub for Citrix, from Citrix and uh, Alexa for Business. Um, we know that a great user experience starts with the Citrix Workspace app. Um, with the Citrix Workspace app, users are able to get access to all of their apps and files through a sleek and intuitive interface. Um, but more importantly, the user is able to have the same experience whether they're using their smartphone, desktop, laptop, tablet, or any other device. Um, and then, honestly, uh, the second most uh, the second most common question we get is: Is device enrollment easy? So, with the endpoint management service and the Citrix Workspace app, new employees can enable any device, Windows, Mac, iOS, Android, or Linux, um, to become a Citrix secure digital workspace in just a few easy steps. Um, users will go through a series of click-throughs, which will enable the service and, and enroll the device. Um, so what are, the, what are the opportunities for CSPs here? Essentially, you'll be able to improve the security posture of your customers, no matter what device they want to use to get work done. Um, you'll be able to keep users productive and engaged um, while staying secure. Um, you'll be able to give them the freedom to access any app, content, or website securely. And all of this while delivering cost savings to your customers through a BYOD initiative. Um, and with that, next we're going to discuss the value that the analytics service brings to managing a customer's workspace. So what we're seeing in the industry is that MSPs are increasingly being targeted with ransomware, and the hackers are demanding payment in untraceable currencies like Bitcoin. So we actually heard a story of an MSP that had to pay 150K in Bitcoin you're being infected with ransomware. So it's definitely not a place you want to be. Um, we know these, these attacks can be devastating for your customers and also crippling for your business. So just to kind of go over some of the points in the slide, um, MSPs are the new target that enables ransomware hackers to paralyze dozens of towns and businesses at once. Uh, the average cost of a data breach is about $4 million. And 28% um, of data breaches in 2018 have involved internal actors. Um, the Citrix Analytics Service gives admins complete visibility into the end user's workspace. It pulls data points from all the services in Citrix Cloud that a user interacts with and aggregates the information in an easy way to make rapid and proactive decisions. Um, the Analytics Service helps aggregate data points from both Citrix and Microsoft sources. So these data points will show things such as um, what time users connected, from where and on what device, uh, what activities they're doing while being connected. Um, it then generates insights, which an admin uh, will be able to take actions on. 
So this is something that I'll show in the demo in just a bit. Um, risk indicators is one of the insights that the analytics service also includes. Um, as you can see, there's different risk indicators that are relevant to the different Citrix services that you may be offering to your customers. Um, these are going to include things like uh, access from a new device for virtual apps and desktops or excessive file sharing for content collaboration. Uh, with all of these indicators, you're able to take actions like blocking a user's access or requesting them to change their password. Um, we wanted to help reduce the thousands of alerts admins receive throughout a week. Um, with a security analytics service, we reduced the need to check every single alert that a user might generate. Um, based on all the data points that the analytics service is aggregating, each user is going to be defined by a risk score. Um, this is going to help admins get a bird's eye view of all of their users and help them determine who they should focus their time to immediately. Um, and admin will be able to drill down into each user and see what data points are defining that score so that they can mitigate these issues from happening again in the future. So this is what the security analytics, analytics dashboard looks like. You can see the user scores we just discussed in the previous slide on the top. And on the right, you'll also notice that there's a watch list of users. So an admin will be able to, um, to be able to manually add users to this list so that they can keep an eye on specific users if needed. When clicking on a specific user from the security dashboard, there's going to be a few actionable items that an admin can take to help them effectively manage the security concern. So we'll show what this looks like in the demo, but you can see that they, they, uh, they do include things like locking a device or logging off a user. Along with the security dashboard, we also have a performance analytics dashboard. Um, the first metric is user classification, which is based on the total user experience data points that the analytics service is aggregating. So these include data points such as user session counts, session failures, session responsiveness, um, and also log on duration. So we know that sluggish sessions or not being able to log in are some of the most common help desk support tickets we've seen from our partners. Um, and and with, the, with the performance analytics dashboard, admins will be able to hone in on exactly what are causing these issues and quickly act on them. Um, so effectively, we're, we are trying to reduce Kind of help reduce the help this is, help this take account as much as possible. Um, so, what are the opportunities for CSPs? Essentially, with the analytics service, our goal is to give you an extra layer of visibility and security into your customers' environment, and we want to help you protect your customers from internal and external threats, while also giving you the ability to be proactive in your security approach. And next, we're going to have a demo on what this actually looks like. So to start this demo, I'm going to go back to where we were before, back at the admin page for Citrix Cloud, and I'm going to click on to the uh, analytics service. And uh, from here, I'm going to select on the demo I've actually set up for um, set up for today. Click on that. And once this opens up, we're going to be at the security dashboard that I just mentioned earlier. Okay, that's coming up right now. So this is a security dashboard where we'll immediately be able to see who our current risky users are. Um, the platform actually defines high, medium, and low risk users, as well as keeps a user watch list. Um, the parameters used to define these risk levels are all customizable, and I'll show in a bit. Um, I'll show you in a bit how those are actually calculated. So I'm going to go ahead and click on our highest risk highest risk user, Georgina, and from here we'll be able to see a timeline of all our activities which have caused her to be on the top of the list. So if I click on any of these specific enders, like let's say uh, first time access from a, from a new location, we're going to see what she did and what is causing this indicator to go off. So you know how many times has she logged in? And if I click on say excessive authorization failures, I'm going to get a detailed list of all the times that she's tried to get access and from what IP address and location. Um, these are all the things that have caused her to get such a high score. Um, so next, I want to take you to the settings page where we can create our own indicators for what we want the environment to monitor, right? So these are all the defaults, but I'm going to go ahead and click on Create Indicator. And here's where we can choose things like what service we want to monitor, what severity level it will be, um, and what will trigger this indicator, right? Such as access control, you could set, set low, medium, or high, um, and, and set that indicator um, pretty much, that's pretty much how you would set that up, right? Um, 
I also want to go into the policies tab and show how we can generate actions based off of the indicators that we've created. So I'm going to go and click on create a policy. I'm going to select a condition, which can be based on either something like risk score um, or even something specific. So we could do um, log on from a suspicious IP. Um, and then if I wanted to, I can actually add a second condition or even a third. So let's just say I wanted to select unusual time of application access. Um, and then I can select what I want to happen. So we could do things like notifying the administrator um, or even logging off the user if you want to be a bit more extreme. Um, and this is what's going to trigger once all of those indicators have actually happened. Um, next, you would just give it a policy name and just create the policy. So that's essentially what we were looking at before with Georgina and why she was a high risk user and, the, and that there were actions that were taken against her. Um, at a high level, that's what I wanted to show in this analytics demo. I know it was quick, but we will have time for questions at the end. And I'm going to hand it over to Rose for the next poll. Great. So we actually are going to have two polls back to back here that are similar. Um, but what we're asking is if you have any customers with the following applications. And this poll will allow you to select multiple choices. So um, in this first question, we have SAP Ariba, SAP Concur, Salesforce, Workday, and ServiceNow. So I'll give you a few more seconds to respond. Again, select as many options as apply. Okay, we'll close this one. So in this first question, uh, we can see that many customers are using Salesforce, also ServiceNow is another popular application, um, with some using SAP Concur and Workday. Would you like me to jump into the, uh, the next option, or, or the next question? Yeah, yep. Rose, let's jump into the next one. Okay, this is a very similar uh, poll. Um, we just couldn't put as many uh, choices in each poll question, so we just had to divide it up. So if you could, again, uh, just choose as many that apply. Um, if, if none is the option, obviously you don't have to respond to this poll. Um, but if you do have uh, customers using Tableau, G Suite, Jira, Microsoft Dynamics CRM, or Zendesk, you can Select those options in the poll here. We'll give you a couple more seconds. All right. And we'll show these results. So it looks like uh, half of the respondents have uh, customers with Microsoft Dynamics CRM and another popular application that is G Suite. Awesome. Thank you, Rose. Um, yeah, so it, good news that a lot of your customers are using these applications. Um, so we're going to show you how we can um, improve productivity uh, for those apps with micro apps, um, as well as differentiating your offering with micro apps. So uh, thanks for sticking with us. This is the uh, last section and last demo that we have. So um, you can see some stats on the screen here regarding employee experience and in engagement. And a study from Gallup found that 51% of employees are not engaged and 16% are actively disengaged. Um, you know, 47% of business leaders say that the biggest contribution to employee engagement is ease of access to information, right? So, um, you know, there's, there's a, a few more stats on the screen, um, but what we know is that a, a good employee experience is key to driving engagement and productivity of your customers' employees. Um, so, and your customers should be able to quantify what that productivity means to them. So what if their staff was 10% more efficient or 20% more efficient or could process 300% more workflows with the same amount of staff? Um, and these modern enterprise applications and, and SaaS applications were meant to make life easier. But what we still see is that organizations have too many apps and SaaS apps and that their employees need to do their job. I found a stat online that said that the average 250 to 500 user company 
has 150 applications and websites that they use across their organization. And these SaaS apps were really meant to make life easier, but they're actually very complex, right? There's too many clicks to execute some very basic common tasks. And then we have all of these interruptions throughout the day and, you know, switching between all these applications. And when the employee flips, flips over to a web browser, they might find themselves browsing their favorite news site or social media. So the end result is too little usage, too much searching, and too much, uh, too little focus. So here's an example of a <clears throat> Salesforce uh, workflow and how many clicks it takes to find an opportunity and enter details. So in, in a uh, real life example, um, just last week, I counted that it took me 14 clicks to submit a PTO on Workday. So on top of that, if you have a user that makes mistakes or clicks on the wrong link or doesn't know where to go, that could take even more clicks or take even longer, right? Taking them away from being productive just to execute a very basic task. So as an analogy, we think of enterprise software as like a photo photocopier. So the copier has uh, tons of buttons on it and those buttons have a purpose, right? Somebody out there needs to make 20 double-sided color copies that need to be collated and stapled and three-hole punched. But most people just need to walk up and press that one big green button. And if they need two copies, they might just press that big green button twice. So the challenge with enterprise software today is that it's all of those little red buttons. So each app was built with the power user in mind, but most users are in that 99% where they just need to take a very simple action. So with micro apps, uh, what we're doing is bringing that big green button experience to enterprise software. So a micro app is a presentation of a single use case or a single workflow or a single action from a business application and allows the end users to execute it with just a few clicks and without having to switch into the full application. So, you know, Citrix Workspace is already the leading workspace where employees go to access all of their apps, their desktops, their data. And now we've integrated the new micro app and intelligent capabilities and redesigned the UI of Citrix Workspace for a more interactive uh, experience. So the first thing that we have that your users get is the new intelligent feed, where right in the middle of their workspace is the, the feed of activities from these business applications that are relevant to those users. And the micro app is pulling the data from what is going on inside of the enterprise application and uh, displaying what is relevant to each user from the system of record. And the system of record is how we are integrating in with those enterprise applications. And so each item in the feed is what we call a card. And you know the user can click on it to get more information. Some items might be informational, such as event reminders, while other cards will show you know, the user's uh, available actions that they can take on that card, such as approving or rejecting uh, an expense report. And like I said, some cards are, are notif notifications for uh, insights of what's going on in these apps. And some cards allow you to take action and you can see the recommended actions pane over on the right, as well as the actions button on the left, which will take a user to all of the actions available to them, right? Where they can interact with and within just a few clicks, execute actions or kick off workflows such as submitting a PTO or creating a new opportunity. And then we have the virtual assistant that helps users find the right information across all of the connected uh, systems of record directly from Citrix Workspace. Uh, so it uses natural language speech and you could think of it as an extension of the micro app capabilities from a Q&A perspective. So questions like, who is John Doe? what courses are available to me, how many PTO days do I have left? It has the uh, capability to search through any connected system or uh, repository of information. We also have out of the box integrations with some of the leading SaaS and enterprise software vendors, right? Which as we saw from the poll, a lot of your customers are using today, like Salesforce, Workday, Ariba, Concur, 
Microsoft Dynamics, Tableau, ServiceNow, et cetera. Um, so for your customers that have these applications or are looking to move to these applications, Citrix Workspace empowers you as a service provider to add new value around productivity and engagement to these customers. So with that, Rose, we're gonna kick off the next poll. All right, so this is pretty simple. Does your firm specialize in vertical specific business applications? Just a simple yes or no. I'll give you a few more seconds here. All right, so interesting results. Um, looks like the audience is pretty split. Um, about half are uh, not verticalizing their applications or uh, specializing in vertical specific applications and half are. Awesome, thanks Rose. So for the 47% that are, um, you know, we know that a lot of you guys specialize in specific verticals and industries and you specialize in, you know, niche industry specific applications and you're out there looking for a way to make your offering stand out and, you know, add value that only you can provide. So we have an HTTP integration connector where you can connect to any business application that supports uh, JSON or REST APIs. And if the business application doesn't support that, then there is still a way to create an API wrapper that can interface with the application to extract the data. So by building you know, custom micro apps uh, in your vertical, this is going to allow you to go to market with an offering that only customers can get from you, right? And you'll likely get uh, you know, higher margins for this type of offering. Um, you know, that is gonna, because it's gonna improve your customers' productivity and workflows. And we have the micro app builder, which is a low code, no code interface that allows you to uh, build out the micro apps and control how the cards and information will be presented to the users. And I'll show this a little bit in the demo. And one of our CSPs, Drew Rosado from CompuData, attended Citrix Converge. That was the first ever developer conference um, from Citrix. And CompuData specializes in ERPs and in the manufacturing and distribution space. And they're in the process of, of building micro apps that will give their customers deeper insights into what is going on uh, in their ERP and accounting systems, as well as simplifying workflows by daisy chaining micro apps and allowing their users to take action on the most common tasks of these business applications, right? All from right within Citrix Workspace. So this is gonna be a great offering from CompuData that will give them a competitive edge in the manufacturing and distribution space. So to wrap up on the business opportunity for micro apps, right? This will help you uh, add productivity to your customers that are using those top SaaS apps. And it will enable you to build a differentiated offering in your vertical space and will allow you to get in deeper with your customers you know, business processes as you go through the process of building out their micro apps and workflows and integrations that only you can offer, right? So being able to go to market in a specific vertical and showcase that you really know your customer's business, you really know the applications they use, and, you know, you really know their processes and workflows and being able to showcase, you know, something that only you can provide. So with that, we're going to jump into the last demo of micro apps. So I am by no means an expert on micro apps, but I'm gonna show you how I was able to get up and running and start playing with it. So if you go to developer.cloud.com, and you can do this now, go to developer.cloud.com and click on Citrix Workspace, and then click on get your test instance and create or access test instance. This will then ask you for your Citrix Cloud credentials, and then in about 10 to 15 minutes, it will spin you up a 30-day uh, developer test instance where you can go in and start playing with and getting your hands on uh, our new micro app and intelligent capabilities. So flipping back to my workspace, I'm gonna log in to my developer test instance. 
and you know show you uh, what I've done with it and how I got up and running with it. So the first thing that you need to do when you log in is the micro apps tile where you see that manage button, it'll say activate. So if you click on the activate button, it'll take about 10 minutes to go ahead and activate. Then from there, of course, you need cloud connectors and a resource location. So the cloud connectors are how you are tying in your Active Directory domain to be able to assign the micro apps to your Active Directory users. Um, so here, what I'm showing you in my Azure, where in my csp.local domain that we used in the other example, I have two cloud connectors for my micro apps environment, right? So all you really need is a domain, two cloud connectors, and you can start playing around with micro apps in a developer test instance. The other thing that you need to do to get up and running is go to workspace configuration and service integrations and come over here and make sure that the micro apps service is enabled because it comes in disabled by default. And then the next thing that you need to do is go over to customize and click on features and then enable right there where it says actions, virtual assistant and activity feed. That is what's going to turn on that feature for your end users. So once you have all of that set up, you have your developer test instance, you're ready to go and you're ready to um, start building out micro apps. So I'm gonna show you just you know some things that I got um, going with uh, the micro apps in my developer test instance, <clears throat> as well as some of the uh, sample data integrations that we have, right? So I'm just gonna click on manage to pull up the micro app service. So and here's a lot of the micro apps that I've created. And if you click add integration, we have this great sample data where we already have these integrations. And the cool thing is, is that it generates a lot of activity on the back end, right? So we have things like Workday and Salesforce and Concur, ServiceNow. So you can very simply add these integrations. It will pop those micro apps into your, your service where you can then go add subscribers to these micro apps and it's gonna generate all of this activity on the back end for those end users, right? So I've added a number of sample data integrations here, and then you just go into subscriptions on that micro app. And again, you can go in and search from your domain that's being pulled in from the cloud connectors and um, you know add that to your users so they can start to see what some sample data looks like. Then I'm gonna show you how I got up and running with the easiest out of the box integration, which is RSS feeds. So if you go to add integration, you can import a previous one, you can add a custom connector, or we can go look at the full list of the Citrix provided templates um, from all of those vendors that I mentioned in, in the, the uh, presentation. So Workday, Salesforce, Ariba, ServiceNow, right? A lot of these apps that your customers are using today. RSS feeds is the easiest one to get up and running with because all you need is the URL of an RSS feed. The other ones, there's a little bit of integration that we'll talk about later. So from there, I can just log right into my uh, workspace that's provided with my uh, developer test account. And again, this is you know like a cloud hosted storefront. So there's really no configuration there other than picking the URL. So here we can see a lot of that sample data um, activity that's been generated for this user. So I have some stuff coming in from Workday and from my Citrix blogs and um, ServiceNow. And then over on my actions here where I can see the available actions that I have. So just very easily, I know a lot of your customers have service now. I can click on submit incident, click on a few things. You know, it's probably an ID 10T error and just hit submit all from right within my workspace. And then back to my activity feed, right? Right from here with just a simple click, I could go in and uh, approve an expense report, right? Or I could click on that expense report to get some more uh, details, right? From the items detail pane. Uh, I'll click on that again and just go ahead and, and decline that for 781 bucks. So then I wanna show you the, the RSS feed, um, how it looks out of the box and then how I customized it with the micro app builder. Um, so out of the box, right, it's pulling in that RSS feed. It's giving me the, the details where I get a description. I can click view blog post, I can hit share. But when I hit share, it actually prompts to share that via email, right? And I'm kind of thinking, well, nowadays most people share this over social media. 
So I wanted to create a, a second one and customize it to put some more buttons to share with the different social media platforms. So I'm gonna go into the uh, items detail page. And here you can see where, um, you know, I just started playing around with it and I was learning it the first time I went, just dragged some buttons over there, kind of changed the look and feel a little bit. I found, you know, the URL variable and put, you know, the slash share equals Twitter, share, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, et cetera, move the view blog post button towards the top. So now I'll show you how this looks uh, customized just for me playing around with the micro app builder compared to the out of the box experience. Um, so there it's kind of, you know, what you see is what you get. So now I have all those share buttons where I could just one click very easily go in and share out that blog post on uh, LinkedIn. Um, so that's what I wanted to show you guys with, uh, you know, just how I was able to get up and running with uh, playing around with the micro apps. I definitely recommend that you go to developer.cloud.com and get your test instance. And then, as you guys mentioned, a lot of your customers have a lot of these um, SaaS applications that we have out-of-the-box integrations for. Um, setting this stuff up is very well documented in our uh, product docs, right? So if you're setting up Salesforce, just go to the product documentation page, and it's going to give you all this step-by-step -step, um, and prereqs and just things you need to do on the Salesforce side to get that up and running. And then if you do have, if you do want to build a uh, custom micro app, right? If you just search custom micro app, custom integrations, there's a great um, article from uh, from our tech marketing that has a video that shows building a custom micro app. And even in a case where they need to build an API wrapper for an application that doesn't support um, JSON or, or REST uh, APIs. Um, so that's pretty much it for the micro apps demo. I recommend you guys uh, go get your developer test instance from developer.cloud.com. And with that, Rose, we're gonna jump into the next poll. All right, so given our current situation with the coronavirus, are you seeing an increased demand for your offering? So you can select just yes or no. We'll give you a few more seconds. All right. So this is very much in line with what we've been hearing, but um, due to the coronavirus, it does seem like there has been a, a much bigger demand for CSP solutions. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Good to know that you guys are getting more, uh, you know, not good scenario of coronavirus, but um, that you guys are empowering people to continue to work. Um, so, you know, one of the, the points that I want to bring up is that, you know, we've talked a lot about Citrix Cloud, but a lot of you have an existing investment of on-prem virtual apps and desktops. So with site aggregation, you can take advantage of your existing investment and integrate the published apps and desktops from your on-prem delivery controllers into your customer's workspace, where they will have access to all of their files, all their web and SaaS apps, the new micro app functionality, right, all alongside those on-prem virtual apps and desktops, right? So we walked through the full Citrix workspace stack and talked about, you know, the challenges that your customers face, uh, the challenge around securing SaaS apps and the challenges of securing devices and the challenges of data sprawl and SaaS app sprawl and the employee experience challenges around loss of uh, productivity or engagement and how Citrix workspace solves these challenges and delivers the world's best productivity where work gets done. But let's take a step back for a minute and talk about what the business value is. What are the, uh, you know, the business outcomes that you're delivering to your customers with Citrix Workspace? So by centralizing all of your customers' apps and desktops and data in a single pane of glass that's accessible from anywhere in the world, you're driving productivity, experience, and engagement for your customers, right, and empowering Work from anywhere has, you know, many different benefits, including, you know, improving your customer's work-life balance, which is huge for hiring and reti retaining top talent. Uh, your customers can securely embrace BYOD, which has, you know, huge operational and cost-saving benefits. 
Um, you're enabling your customers to hire remote employees, which enables them to tap into a, a global talent pool, as well as the operational and, and cost savings by reducing physical office space. You're enabling them to seamlessly expand to new locations, right? They just need an internet connection and some thin clients or cheap devices, and they're ready to go with their workspace, right? So you're driving uh, employee engagement and experience while delivering new levels of business agility and layering on top of that all these additional layers of security. So that is the Citrix workspace advantage that you're delivering to your customers. So that's the value to your customers, but what's in it for you? So delivering the Citrix workspace enables you to increase your total addressable market, as well as increasing your average uh, revenue per user while differentiating your offering with the world's best workspace that automates, organizes, and guides work. And this also gives you a way to add new value and security to your uh, SaaS customers and to be able to stay relevant in a SaaS-based world while, while delivering a complete productivity solution to get work done. Um, so with that, you know, I know we covered a lot today, uh, you know, kind of from a high level, but definitely um, get with your PAM, get with your SE to start getting your hands on some of these uh, Citrix Workspace and Citrix Cloud services. And with that, Rose, we'll kick off the last poll. All right, so um, going forward, what topics would you be interested in learning about for a future CSP masterclass like this? So uh, we've given you a few options. You can also use the uh, question or chat function to put in other topics that perhaps are not listed here. Um, but some suggestions we might have are, you know, Windows Virtual Desktops and Azure integration, Citrix Managed Desktops, which is our all-in-one uh, desktop as a service solution sold with Citrix Azure or Bring Your Own Azure, uh, Citrix SD WAN, HDX Insight, or multi-tenant Citrix Cloud. So you can choose as many as you're interested in, and this will help guide us for future trainings. Give you one more second. All right. So it looks like we have a lot of interest in uh, multi-tenant Citrix Cloud, which is great, and Citrix Managed Desktops. Um, so we can share additional resources following this webinar with what we have now, but we'll uh, absolutely take that into consideration for scheduling a, a future class like this. All right, so Rose, with that, we will hand it over to Avelio and to uh, JP to cover some of the questions in the chat live. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so feel free to go ahead and type any additional questions you may have. We'll start by tackling some questions that we already got through the chat and actually talking about uh, virtual desktops. Uh, I'd like to start with that question, which, is, which seemed uh, very interesting. Uh, and the question is, since Citrix does hosting on Azure, how is it different from Citrix virtual apps and desktops versus Azure Windows uh, virtual desktop? So, so we think of the of the Citrix and WVD story as a better together story, right? So, so we'll think that WVD is a viable choice for your DAS solution. Uh, and, and keep in mind that you can also use it uh, as a platform to host uh, resources for virtual apps and desktops. In general, uh, WVD does lack the Citrix HDX technologies, the network management technologies, and the resource management technologies like MCS, WAM, and Auto Scale, which we already reviewed uh, during the webinar, which makes Citrix the, the best choice for uh, enterprise-grade uh, DAS offerings. So that's that's why we think that Citrix still has the edge uh, when it comes to, to, to DAS offerings. Yep. Thank you, JP. And, and uh, the team uh, has been really, really good on, on making sure that we tackle a lot of the questions that have been coming in uh, live as, as they were flowing in. Um, we did get one that I definitely wanted to, to kind of bring back up and discuss uh, broadly here. And, and that's, uh, you know, where, where to go for additional training. Uh, it was answered in the chat, and everyone should be able to uh, take a look at, at that chat response. However, we're also going to be sending um, in uh, in the email, we're, we're going to be sending additional links for uh, additional resources, right? But things like um, Sales IQ is going to have a lot of uh, a lot of those resources right now called Seismic. 
uh, enablement.citrix.com and training.citrix.com are going to be additional resources. And for uh, some of the Citrix Cloud um, how-to guides, we're also going to be able to leverage success.citrix.com. Like I said, I know I just rattled off a whole bunch of different links, uh, but those will actually be recapped in, in an email that gets sent out. Awesome, thanks, Evelio. Okay, so next question we got, very interesting, says, could we create a VPN between Citrix DCs and our DCs, uh, meaning data centers, like an IPsec VPN tunnel? So. Uh, creating a, a VPN tunnel between uh, Citrix services and your data center is actually not required. Citrix provides connectors uh, for the services that we host in Citrix Cloud, like the gateway connector for the um, SaaS uh, access control service, uh, the uh, connector appliance for micro apps, and the Citrix like, con Cloud connector for uh, the virtual apps and desktop service. So these connectors ensure that Citrix Cloud can communicate with your data center via a secure connection, the HTTPS, without the need of uh, providing or requiring an IPsec connection. Additionally, for Citrix managed desktops, there's also a way to integrate the Citrix managed desktop service uh, with your data center via SD-WAN by utilizing the SD-WAN orchestrator service. So we just got um, a few questions come in, um, specifically on the on the connector, right? Um, does a connector support IPv6, right? Um, how the, the connector is gonna be communicating is actually by establishing an outbound um, SSL session, right? A, a 443 communication. Um, we do need to have a port 80 enabled on the outbound so that we could do a certificate validation check. Um, however, all active communication will be going um, outbound 443 and, and maintaining that, that long-lived ticket. Um, specific to IPv6, uh, JP, do, do you have any details there? Uh, so quite honestly, I do not. Uh, we have not seen a lot of IPv6 uh, customers, quite honestly, uh, yet on the field. So. I'd be happy to expand uh, and, and take this offline just to see what the actual requirement is and, and, and take it further. Perfect, perfect. Uh, so we did uh, get another, an, another good question here. Um, how can the on-prem licenses be transferred to cloud licenses? Um, and you know the, the answer as, a, as is common is it depends, right? It does depend on uh, what type of license was being leveraged. Um, if it is a CSP license that is sitting on prem, it's it's fairly simple, right? It's consumption based. So uh, we uh, ramp up into Citrix Cloud and begin consuming there. And as we're consuming in Citrix Cloud, then we reduce the consumption uh, for those on prem licenses, right? So it makes it very, very easy to uh, reduce consumption, increase consumption as we go. Um, however, Right. Um, if those licenses are actually uh, owned by the customer, then, then that conversation is going to be um, a little bit different. Uh, in this case, actually, the person asking the question is uh, one of my partners. So I'll make sure to go ahead and schedule a call uh, with you and, and take that, that conversation deeper. Awesome. Thanks, Evelio. Another great question. Can you publish internal apps from your data center through the Citrix Access Control Service? So the answer is yes. Actually, this relates to the previous question uh, we had, uh, where I, I, I mentioned the, the connectors that, that we have for the um, Access Control Service. So by deploying a gateway connector in your data center, uh, you are able to connect and deploy uh, SaaS applications in your data center uh, and, and publish them through the uh, Citrix Access Control Service. So we did get a question um, that I'm not sure that we'll have a, an answer to this, uh, at least for live right now, but to uh, to bring it up, right, will there be any consolidation of the multiple connectors, right? So, um, you know, the, the, the goal um, at Citrix is to be uh, constantly evolving, right, and, and making the end user experience as well as the administration experience um, as seamless as possible. Um, you know, at, at this time, I, I don't have the, the roadmap answer. However, that could be had with the product management team. 
but the goal, um, as I mentioned, right, and, and aligning with uh, with the, the the messaging that I just provided is is to make it as seamless as, as possible. Uh, so consolidation um, should be in the future. From again, from a roadmap perspective, that could be uh, further detailed um, later on. Thank you, Valerie. And the last question before we wrap it up here. Uh, can Citrix manage your VDAs on the virtual apps and desktop service in Citrix Cloud? Right, so actually not for the virtual apps and desktop service. And now we know that you guys are very interested in Citrix managed desktops. And this is what Citrix managed desktops does, right? Not only do we manage the uh, control layer and the access layer in Citrix Cloud as part of workspace, but we also can manage your workloads in a Citrix managed Azure subscription so that you as a CSP can only deliver a service without having to worry uh, about deploying uh, desktops and applications in a data center or a public cloud that you manage. So yes, more, more to come on that, hopefully on a future iteration of the Citrix uh, Journey to the Cloud Masterclass. Thanks, JP. And with this, Chris, I think we'll yep. pass it out to you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, if there's no more questions, then, Rose, I think we'll wrap it up. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for attending. We'll send out an email afterwards uh, with all of the, um, with the recording, the deck, and also some of the related resources we discussed today. Take care. Thanks for joining.